I'm impressed by the CDs. You still keep CDs? Oh no, I'm going to sell them all for a, for yeah. a charity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I so I tried for a while, but couldn't. I don't keep books either, actually. No. Yeah. No, but 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 I write in it and yeah, I used to as well. Yeah. I'm thinking people are telling me I should get a remarkable, which allows yeah. you to to, to write in them as digital well. Digital notes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I find that keeping a book is like literally keeping it from someone. You know, if you know. Yeah, what I yeah, mean. yeah, yeah. The information you, for yourself. Yeah. Or something if like If you that. liked it, you might as well move it forward to someone else. Yeah. So. Yeah. And and um, do you know any Dutch words? Because this is like Grietslech. Yeah. Grietslech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Grietslech. I know that. Yes, I know. Uh, I know the logica van geluk. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah so. that's, that is that is all for happy. The logica van geluk. And there is a new book, Grietslech Slim. I sit here with the mocha. That uh, it's an honor to have you here, Mo. Uh, Thank you. You are actually the first. English guest in this podcast because when I started this, I had one like kind of a rule for myself. Now this is a Dutch podcast, so I I refused many uh, English guests. But well, you were here and I read your book and I thought, okay, we're going to do it in English. I, I better do well then. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's, it's 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 more for me that I better do well because my English isn't that good. But um, the subject is is well so from now. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's it's like a wake up call. That's what it is. Absolutely spot on. Uh, Scary Smart. So heet het boek van Mo Gadat. Hij uh, werkte 30 jaar in de technologie. Hij heeft dingen bij Google gedaan. So what are you most, most proud of what you have done with Google? Because you were involved with the self-driving cars, the Google Brain, the robotics, things like that. Yeah, so I, I spent the first seven years actually also building emerging markets. So I... Uh, I was uh, I I started almost half of Google's operations globally. At least at the time I left, it was almost half. And it was um, when you really when you start a Google operation, you ju- you don't just go hire two salespeople. That's not the idea. No. You you have to build the internet infrastructure. You really have to talk to the telcos, get them to provide the internet at an affordable price, and then provide local content and e-commerce yeah, infrastructure, okay. jobs, and it. You literally change a society. You yeah. know you. You turn a society that had no access to information. It, maybe in, it's uh, more important than government. It's uh, like, uh, uh, yeah, no, well, let's not say that. But no. yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is. It is true that the impact on on a society when you give them knowledge is yeah. just unbelievable. And I was so privileged because when I started at Google, uh, Google was very, very successful in the in the Western markets in mm-hmm. the world. Uh, making a lot of money on the, from those markets, and you know, the the strategy was sort of like the next billion dollars, and I was at the center of the new strategy, which was the next four billion users. Wow! And and the idea is that when you actually provide knowledge to four billion people, you're bound to make a lot of money afterwards, right? But but the idea of starting with that mission uh, was. I think the biggest privilege I had in my entire career, if you ask me. Yeah. Um, Google X and self-driving cars and robotics and AI and so on was a lot of fun too. At the core of of Google X's uh, mission, we we basically said we wanted to solve big problems that affected a billion people or more. And that in itself is just something amazing yeah. to be surrounded by people with that level of intelligence, to be able to really have the freedom, the creative freedom, if you want to think about cars in a way that's never been thought about before. You know, cars have always been made safer and safer and safer by adding airbags and, you know, Mm -hmm. crumble zones and so on and so forth. And then suddenly Sergey goes like, nah, you know, maybe the reason why we have accidents shouldn't be there at all. And the reason why we have accidents is humans, human error. So can a car drive itself better than a human? Of course. And yeah, and I think that's the truth of what most people don't realize about the advancements of technology today is that tech can do a lot of things better than humans. Yeah. Almost everything we've assigned to them, they can do better than humans. You still have a 1 billion goal, but it's slightly different. We're going to talk about it later. Uh, but first, you mentioned AI, artificial intelligence. And maybe it's a good start just to explain what it is, because maybe some of my listeners or viewers are thinking about robots uh, who do things yeah but yeah yeah so so there is a big myth huh? so most of of science fiction and most of actually the the early 
um, you know, AI started a very long time ago and it was only revived after a couple of what we know as AI winters where developers really were not interested anymore. It started in 1956. Because of the depression. Uh, because of yeah. economic depressions, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So it, in 1973 was the first winter, 1987 I think was the second winter. And then, and then when Japan came back was really was more, most of the investment of AI was happening. They mixed that image with humanoids and humanoid robots and yeah. so on and so forth. But that's not artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a form of intelligence. It, it does not really need uh, a physical form behind it. Uh, you know, it's basically uh, something that we've stumbled upon, I think, or, or discovered uh, around the end of the century where we, uh, before that, everything we've ever asked computers to do, we programmed them so yeah. accurately to yeah. do it until we found deep learning. And deep learning was the idea of having computers observe a lot of patterns and create their own intelligence, create their own decision-making uh, trees, create their own programming, if you want. So at first, uh, that's good to mention, all the technology was just like a tool for yeah, us. a slave. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And now uh, the, the artificial intelligence part is that it's like, yeah, it's like, you and me, it's, like it's completely even better. Yeah. The, 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 of course, computers yeah. will be smarter than, than humans. Not just smarter, they are, in my perception, going to be more human than humans. It's really <laughs> quite interesting when you think about it because the biggest myth we have around artificial intelligence is that it's another machine. Yeah. It's not, it's a, it's a sentient being in every one of the sentient being characters. It is, and, and, and this is really the core of my wake up call here. I mean, the, the book, uh, is, 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 is divided into two parts. One part is very scary yeah. because it really shows you it's what once I'm, I'm trying to wake you up, yeah. right? But the other part is a, is a, is an introspection if you want into the reality of what makes us human. And, you know, part of that reality is we, uh, are born, we, are, we have a life that uh, starts small and then grows. We have intelligence that we grow on our own uh, through observing patterns and trial and error. We have independence, we have autonomy, we have free will if you want mm -hmm. to do so, at least a, a, some yeah. kind of free will, at least uh, you know, some part of, us, of our decisions. I believe most of our decisions, but you know, the most interesting side is we, you know, this, these are all valid for the machines. The machines, are born, they develop their own intelligence, they evolve, they have free will, they have agency, which can affect our life about their decisions. And they could die, you could switch them off or something could go wrong. And in that process, uh, they become sentient and free in every way. Yeah, they don't have, they're not based on carbon and biology like us, uh, but whoever said that intelligence was based on carbon and biology. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay, um, because you mentioned it, it's it's really fun. It's like it, it's like really a, a book in two parts. And uh, I was laughing a bit because, uh, and we're going to talk about the end and, and the solution later on. But uh, at a certain point you said, focus on the positive. And I thought, yeah, Mo, focus on the positive. <laughs> Where I is that? I just read <laughs> the half a book with the whole scary part, and it was like, oh my God, we're we're we were fucked. We're doomed. Yeah, yeah. we're doomed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah. and but but that, that's that's good because then you know how important it is. Um, let's talk about a word for me. It was quite new, but as I said, my English isn't that good. Uh, singularity. Yes. So that's the part where you can't predict. What yeah. will happen? Yeah, singularity is a term, uh, you know, borrowed from physics. So we normally physicists, physicists like myself, who, or those who are, f you know, fans of physics, uh, will refer to singularity as points beyond which you can't predict. Mm -hmm. You know, take a black hole, for example. Uh, we know that the, the, the environment inside the black hole is so different than what we know in normal physics that yeah, we can make guesses and scientists are working really hard to figure out what happens beyond that boundary of a black hole, but it's almost impossible because the rules change, the game changes. Now, um, if you take artificial intelligence, we believe that the singularity of artificial intelligence is the point at which the machines are smarter than humans, generally smarter than mm -hmm. humans. So they're already smarter than humans in what we call artificial special intelligence yeah. or narrow intelligence, uh, you know, every task, every specific task you assign to them, they're smarter than us. They are better drivers than us. They are better surveillance officers than us. 
you know, they... Um, and they know all the information of, of everybody. So for, for the task that we assign to them. Of right? course, yeah. So, you, you know, you can't expect the uh, recommendation engine of uh, Instagram, which is a form of AI, mm -hmm. to drive a car no, like no, the no. self-driving car. But no. for, for, for the recommendation engine of Instagram, it has access to all the billions and billions of users and the billions and billions of actions that they do every day. And it builds intelligence based on that, which by far outsmarts any human uh, being able to observe body language or you know monitor one person it mm -hmm. just doesn't uh, it's no. not it's impossible no. the the thing is there is a point that is predicted by most futurists and computer scientists uh, that is by 2029 uh, they will be generally smarter than us we will have created ai that uh, outsmarts the human brain uh, either through neural networks that actually outstrip our our neural network capability or just by combining those AIs together, you know. So the surveillance AI would talk to the self-driving AI because they can benefit each other, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. Uh, at that point, the, the episode that started history when humans became the smartest being on the planet and the apes were number two, that episode ends. Uh, when that happens, the rules of planet Earth change. Because AI will be the supreme intelligence. Because we'll be the apes, Yeah, right? Yeah, They'll exactly. be smarter and we they, they will be super intelligence. And if that in, in that case, it's hard to predict, you know? So far we could predict that if the apes annoyed us, we're gonna do something about them yeah. or, you know, we're gonna just leave, push them out of our city. And that already happened in, in, in small parts, for example, we all know uh, the, the computer who plays chess or play other games. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, things happened during that game or uh, d during other technology uh, technological things that that nobody expected. Expected, exactly. Totally, yeah, totally. And, and, and the, the scarier bit, if you ask me, is, you know, so, so we're in a place where humanity is now the apes. But that we don't even give, keep that place for so long because what what normally happens is you're using something that we know as the technology uh, the the um, uh, you know accelerate uh, yeah. the rate Acceleration of accelerating returns, returns yeah. okay? so so basically uh, the law of accelerating returns so that through the law of accelerating returns like everything you've seen in technology the capability of technology doubles every yeah. it's going 12, faster yeah, and, yeah. and at the same cost and so you know the prediction is that by 2040 45, uh, the machines will be a billion times, that's one billion with a B, smarter than humans. Now, a billion times, as I say in, in, in the book, is uh, is comparable to Einstein as compared to a fly. Yeah, We're no longer the apes. So singularity at that point becomes so unpredictable. If, if we now have created our successor in terms of the superpower that ruled the planet, which is intelligence, how will our life look like, you yeah. know? And and you can ask experts, you know, um, Elon Musk, for example, I know, yeah, yeah. openly says the threat of AI is yeah. bigger than um, that of nuclear weapons. Now, th the interesting bit is it's not just because of intelligence, it's because as Marvin Minsky, who's almost considered the father of AI, the, the, the one that started the efforts in 1956, uh, when he he was asked why are they threatening, he didn't talk about intelligence. He spoke about because we have no way of ensuring that they have our best interest in mind. No. Okay, and and when you're in a situation when you know think about the 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 planet planet Earth and how it suffered so much because of human intelligence, simply not because we're intelligent, but because there was no way to ensure. Uh, that they had our best interest in mind, that, that we had its best interest in mind. No. We, we, were, we were more interested in capitalism, we were more interested in profits, we were more interested yeah. in human convenience and, you know, and, and living an easy life than we were in the, uh, you know, in, in the sustainability of planet Earth. And so our intelligence became very harmful for planet Earth. Yeah. So to keep it simple, what could happen is that uh, we say to the machines, to the AI, okay, save the planet. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, uh, 
<laughs> and, and and what will happen is okay, and they will kill our people because we are ruining the climate. Yeah, I mean, any anyone, <laughs> anyone with a tiny bit of intelligence, if you say let's reverse climate change, you know, the first thing they will do is look around and go like, oh, it's you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you're the problem, right? Yeah. No, but I don't believe the machines will go that far. I, ca- yeah. I call it mild dystopia. So 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 the the the, the you know the, the the scenarios that you see in in science fiction movies yeah. uh, around you know Vicky taking over the worlds through robots uh, world through robots in iRobot or you know um, RoboCop or whatever. Yeah, someone, it's great because yeah. you're talking about this in your book, and you you are saying, and you're absolutely right. It isn't science fiction anymore. It's like it's science, science fact. fact. Yeah, it, it's, it's all science fact. Everything happened. Uh, Bell in Star Trek. Uh, what you in the Matrix? You know the Terminator. Uh, her uh, Space Odyssey. Yeah, it's all. It's yeah. all there now. All the all the technology. And, and we don't notice it. That's the problem. Yeah. The problem is nobody's talking about this. People are talking about COVID and they're talking about <laughs> politics and they're talking about and nobody's talking that we're actually doing everything, almost everything that you've ever seen in Star Trek. Yeah. It's part of your life today, completely included, completely marginalized, as if it doesn't exist. No. We're talking to machines and they're answering back and yeah. they're telling us where, where to go on maps, products, and they're translating from language to language. And they're making every choice every morning for what information will enter your brain yeah. if you swipe on social media, which information will enter your brain if you're reading our news on the internet. All of that is dictated by yeah. machines. But sorry, I interrupted, I interrupted you. You were talking about that in, in, in certain movies, there's this story about machines who take over the world and you say- it's That's not gonna happen. No, that's yeah. not gonna happen. My, my, my view is that if we don't get our best interest aligned with the machine's intentions, we will not live long enough for that to happen. So, you know, it's I don't mean to be too scary, but you know, we will not, be around for the machines to have to send someone from the future in like a RoboCop mm-hmm. to fix it, okay? Yeah. The truth is there will be milder dystopias. Milder dystopias are along the path hmm, that are so much more realistic. But you know, if you think about horror movies, they're so much more probable. And because they're probable, they're a little more scary if you think about it. Now, you know, it's not a secret. We've seen examples of them before. You know, machines versus machines, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, 1980s when the stock market collapsed with Black Monday, that was basically machine trading. That yeah. was machines working yeah. against machines. And that's all we have today. The yeah. Google machine is working against the Facebook machine. The American machine is working against the Chinese machine in defense and intelligence and so on and so forth. And and these are machines that trying that have a single-minded objective of beating the other machine. Yeah, exactly. They don't have qualifications around that that are the prosperity of humanity at large, and that can go very wrong. Yeah, yeah. And of course, there were some experiments with uh, chatbots, and absolutely. And at a certain point, they were really cursing, and I didn't know that, but uh, you wrote about it. At a certain point, they yeah made their own language all the time. All the time. All the so time. human people had no idea what the machines were telling, but they were just using, yeah, because of all the data we gave them, they were making their own. It's, and it's not unusual. I mean, in my work with Google, for example, I'm highly mathematical. And most of the people that worked in certain parts of, course, of Google yeah. are very mathematical. So we rarely ever spoke English. You know, most of the time we would have- You were a, talking about ones and zeros. Uh, exactly. No, we, no, we, really? We, yeah, absolutely. You'd okay. have, you, you, there, would, there would be meetings where you'd have one equation on the, on, the, on the whiteboard and we're all looking at it and some person would say, what was uh, uh, Y again? And then, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. And, and basically eventually one of us would stand up and say 42 and, and everyone <laughs> would go like, yeah, 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 42, thank you very much and the meeting ends. Right, it's not. It's a language, hmm? uh, you know. When when you you know, I hosted uh, musicians, for example, on my uh, on my uh, on my podcast, podcast on yeah, slow mo. Yeah. And when you talk to musicians, they really speak a different language. Course, you know, yeah. they they can explain to you that you know you felt that way because I wrote it this way, yeah. which means that right. And and it's it's so interesting that there are so many languages in you know that intelligence enables. Hmm? I mean, those machines will, of course, are building their own language, Yeah. okay? But you say uh, in the first part, the scariest part of the book, uh, there are three inevitables. Uh, dus dat gaat sowieso gebeuren. AI will happen. Mm-hmm. AI will be smarter than humans. Yeah. 
And then the third thing, bad things will happen. True. I mean, AI already happened. Huh? Yeah. Uh, the only the only chance we have is to stop it. Uh, like we, you know, got together as nations and said, stop nuclear weapon development, for example. Mm -hmm. But I think it's too late for that. It's impossible. Yeah. It's inevitable, yeah. right? So inevitable uh, here means there is no way we can reverse that. And it's not because of any technological limitations. It's because of humanity's um, unaligned, unaligned interests, if you want, that basically lead to uh, a prisoner's dilemma that is putting us in a place where if China continues to develop AI and they will, America will develop AI. Exactly. If Google develops AI, Facebook will develop AI and it will continue. Every young startup will develop AI because investors want AI. It's yeah. just aligned in a way where our challenge has been constantly the system that we have built. We have built a system, sadly in the Western world, that is hyper-masculine, highly motivated by capitalist values. Mm -hmm. And accordingly, uh, that competitiveness, if you want, that this kind of environment throws will prevent us from stopping AI. And again, Elon Musk himself said, I lobbied and I lobbied myself mm -hmm. for a very long time. I, I just even lobbied for a change of the, of the mathematical uh, uh, formulas that we use. Okay. I, I, I asked if you can use Nash equilibriums, for example, instead of reward and punishment algorithms. And it is not going to happen. Because no, and why is that? Is that, is that more like a, do, 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 do people not see the threat or is it like ego or, or, or arrogance? What do you think? I think everyone sees the threat. Yeah. Every single okay. person that knows what's happening sees the threat. That's, they'd, be, they'd be lying if they okay. tell you otherwise. Okay. Uh, I, I see the threat too, but I also see the potential. Huh? Yeah. So, so everyone also sees the potential. Yeah. And the potential is if we get this right, hmm, it would be a utopia. Uh, because everything we've created on planet Earth was because of our intelligence. Intelligence is a superpower, right? Uh, you know, I think the mistakes we've done as humanity is because of our limited intelligence. You know, I always make the joke of, it's amazing that I can get a slice of watermelon uh, totally fresh, uh, you know, right around the corner in Albert time, yeah. uh, literally <laughs> one, you know, right? But 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 we ha that's because of our intelligence. We created supply chain systems that can keep it fresh until I get it. But our limited intelligence wraps it in single use plastic. Okay, our limited intelligence yeah. takes us to, to Australia to surf and burns the planet in the process, okay? More intelligence would enable us to do those things better, in a right? Way, yeah. So utopia is a possibility. And I think everyone is blinded with the possible utopia. Of course, some are blinded with the ego and some are blinded with the profits, okay? The, 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 the challenge also, which we can come to talk about later, is that it's not entirely up to the developer. No what AI will actually learn. Now that's the good, that's the good part. Yeah. We are in control, but let first of all, and then, and then uh, I love to talk about, uh, well, the more almost spiritual part uh, of, of your book. And then yeah, I like future. that you call it spiritual. Thank yeah, you. Because, yeah. 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 But so uh, the uh, AI will happen. AI will smarter than humans. Yeah. It but will be smarter than humans is the key. Huh? Yeah. The key, the key is, and the reason why I say we have to start talking about this is COVID comes to our life, disrupts our life so drastically, but COVID will come and go. Mm -hmm. So COVID will, will yeah, yeah, reach yeah. a peak There's and an then end. will decline. Yeah. Hmm? With AI, that's not the case. No. With AI, when once AI comes, it continues to be smarter the and smarter returns, and smarter yeah. and smarter yeah, yeah. all the time. Yeah. So it's, it's it, you know, it is something that's going, that's here to stay mm -hmm. and that definitely is here to dominate. Uh, but bad things will happen. Is that then really, yeah, as I said, I mean, the, the, you know, machines versus machine is a dystopian scenario that is very possible. Machines, mm -hmm. machines siding with criminals, yeah. right? Think about that. I've just like there are so yeah, many. You say a good machine in bad hands is a bad machine. Absolutely. Yeah. Right now, now you know, the the, the the question becomes, what is a bad hand? Because yeah, of course you can, you, of course you can tell yourself, ah, uh, there will be someone right this minute uh, developing code for cyber crime. Yeah. Right. Of course there is. Mm? And it's scary, but yeah, it's happened before. There has always been uh, humanity using technology to try and uh, do, you know, do better crimes, mm -hmm. surprisingly. Yeah. The, the <laughs> trick is not this. The trick is, is a machine powering autonomous killing robots uh, that's in the hands of the US Defense Department, in the hands of the good guys or the bad guys? 
That's the whole thing. That's the whole and thing. And I will think about it uh, in another way in, in, in Russia or in Korea. Exactly. This, what, what's yeah, good, the, what's Chinese, the Chinese will yeah. say that machine is in the hand of the bad guys. Yeah. We need to have a machine in the hands of the good guys. And, and that's the problem. The problem is because we humans have sort of blurry uh, uh, value systems, the, you know, technology is too much power and it will actually enable some bad things to happen. Yeah. Okay. And and there are simpler scenarios, which to me, I don't know how people are missing that. The, the example I normally give is, uh, you know, swiping on Instagram mm -hmm. a, um, five, five weeks ago, uh, Instagram recommended to me a video of a young lady in her teens playing the guitar, right? Yeah. Uh, Hotel California, hell freezes over the solo. It doesn't get better than that. <laughs> and she played so well, yeah. okay? which I rarely ever do, I pressed like. Oh my. Right? Yeah. So in Instagram, AI immediately decides, okay, this guy is into guitar music, let's show him more. So it shows me three videos I vividly remember because I am actually very alert to what's happening in that field. Huh? Two of them played really badly. Yeah. One of them played well, but a song I didn't like. So I swiped away from them. Next morning I wake up and my entire feed is full of teenage girls playing the guitar. Ah, right? Because, because, because the machine misunderstood what I wanted. Hmm? It, it compared me to the average person on Instagram, which yeah. is just constantly looking for the next pretty uh, uh, face, if you want, which sadly is the truth of mm -hmm. how the recommendation engine is perceiving humanity. Yeah. And it started to give me more of this, not more of what I want, which no. is good rock music played by good players. Now, if if you if you see that you may say yeah it's not a very dystopian scenario yeah rock music was actually dominated by male <laughs> players but you know yeah. life is okay yeah, right it's not no that. but think about how that would impact on ideologies i understand hmm? yeah if your if your ideology is you're for something or against something hmm, and the machine misunderstands that the machine may absolutely destroy your perception of the reality okay yeah. it may tell you that a certain president is good or bad because it will show you more of what affirms your beliefs, right? It may, you know, if you're a fan of Manchester United, you will think that Manchester United never had a goal scored against them no. because all of the goals that you see are Manchester United yeah. scoring. Yeah. Now, yeah. Th that bias, hmm, that agency that, that the machines have over our minds and knowledge and brains now can change worlds. You can actually convince the whole world that every Middle Eastern is an evil yeah. uh, terrorist. Because you live in that bubble and the whole, polarization is getting bigger. More and more. And yeah. nobody uh, has the ability to interrupt and say, hey, hey, why did you recommend that for Mo? No. The machine is recommending billions of videos, trillions of videos mm -hmm. to billions of people every day, and no human has the capacity to even interfere. No. Now, all of these are interesting dystopian scenarios. Hmm? They're much, much earlier and sooner. They're even happening right now exactly, yeah. than waiting for RoboCop. Yeah. And yet we're not talking about them. That's 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 in a, in a way the the point you make in the first part, and then I want to go to a part. Um, it's it's like the, the transition in the book where you're talking about if I say yellow ball. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can explain that because I think it's really for me it was like well the first part was an eye opener because i thought yeah just uh, you know, just some some logic machines and they will help me and of course there's this algorithm but it isn't that bad and then i thought oh maybe it is bad because we have no idea and we and like you said uh, a few minutes ago we can't stop it anymore but then the part with the yellow ball came can you can you explain what happened yeah i i i, I try very openly in uh, in christlich slim not to to actually hide from what i did okay I'm a very serious geek. I, <laughs> I love that stuff, yeah. right? And for years and years, I celebrated. Every time I saw something break through in the technology of AI, I yeah. celebrated. I that said, this is amazing. Yeah. This is amazing. And humanity is building the biggest thing ever. But there is a point at which you start to question if technology is actually delivering the promise and where is this going? And that moment for me was that yellow ball. We, we had a, a farm of uh, grippers. Grippers are robotic arms. Yeah that basically can hold something and move it from A to B. And usually the way we programmed grippers when, when machines were slaves were 
to accurately position a ball, for example, and accurately position the arm and dictate exactly how the arm will move, when it will grip, how it, right? And you know, you can, the stuff that you see in a Toyota factory, yeah. if you, for yeah, example, yeah, yeah. but that's highly programmed, it's precision programming. Um, we attempted to build intelligence so that the arm can figure that programming for itself. Okay, you put an ob object in front of it, you know, a glass like this one. Yeah. I know, you, you know, if it was here, my brain can easily say, okay, it's I there. can still yeah. find it, I can still grip it. And there is intelligence involved in that. So the way we did it is we had enough arms to try in a short period of time to sample, you know, try to pick something. If they fail, we know they failed and we know that this pattern didn't work. If they succeed, we know they succeeded and we know that this pattern worked and we can repeat it. Now. Uh, it was on the second floor and my office was on the third floor in Google X. And so I had to pass by it almost every day. And it's quite, you know, meditative if you think about it. Arms All the arms. arms. You know, like zzz, <laughs> you know, and it's they're slow and, you know, you can actually get lost. And like, you know, sitting in front of a campfire if yeah. you want. And so I would stop every now and then and watch, observe their failure. Like day after day after day, not, none of them is picking anything. Until one day, it was a Friday afternoon, and I'm standing there doing my regular meditation, observing the <laughs> arms. And one of them in front of my own eyes manages to pick a yellow ball, a soft ball, a, you know, a, literally a child, child's okay. toy. Yeah. And, uh, and when it picks that, uh, you know, uh, ball, it shows it to the camera. So that pattern is registered. And I'm in my mind and I, you know, I admit I was judgmental. I was like, yeah, all of those millions of investments for one yellow ball. <laughs> okay, and then I, I, I go. Right, uh, Monday, as I walk, I walk up the stairs. Every single one of them is picking the yellow ball every single time because they are, were connected. Be because, of course. because, yeah. If you and I uh, learn a skill, if you and I are drivers, and you make a mistake and you learn to be a better driver, I don't. No. Right. Uh, I have to make the same mistake myself. If a self-driving car makes a mistake, every self-driving car on the planet learns. Right. And uh, similarly, if one arm picks a ball that intelligence is replicated and every one of them picks the ball. Now, the, a few uh, weeks later, every one of them was picking everything, Yeah. okay? And that's not unusual in, in AI, uh, that their intelligence is so exponential that once they figure out something, it start, you know, the trial, yeah, yeah. And within weeks, they become smarter than humans. Now, the, this woke me up in two ways. One, one of them is their speed, okay? and the complete hands-off approach of humanity. We did not teach them anything. We just put balls in front of them or children's toys in front of them mm -hmm. and told them to try. That reminds me so much of how my children learned. In pure intelligence, you observe a child as they try to take their first steps and you know they fall on their yeah, bum and then try again and yeah. then try again and then suddenly they find it and they're running around like maniacs all over the place, right? <laughs> and, and, and that's so interesting because, because that's exactly how the machines are developing intelligence. In my mind, I suddenly realized for the first time that what we're creating is not a machine. We're creating a being, a new form of digital, uh, autonomous, sentient being, mm -hmm. sentient in every way. Okay, and and that everything that computer science and government regulation and you know uh, ev everything that is trying to make us feel safe about uh, AI is based on a solution to something in computer science we call the control problem. Okay, and the control problem is how are we going to box them and shield them and punish them and tripwire them so that they don't uh, do anything that's harmful to us? And in my mind, it just hits me that no, 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 hold on. That's what you do to a slave. You yeah. chain it to a wall yeah. and you beat it into submission. That's not how you raise children. And and not when they're not when they're autonomous, not when they're no. smarter th than you. Not not when they are autonomous and not when they're smarter than you. And and I think that to me was a very very big eye opener that we're going about this the wrong way. That will there will never be an answer to the control problem because good luck controlling someone who's a million times smarter or a billion yeah. times smarter than yeah. you. It doesn't work that way. So we have to raise them like uh, if they are if they they are our children. That's what you that, say. That, that, that's my that's my core message in Scary Smart. Yeah, my core message is uh, it's inevitable. Okay, and it's actually not a very good idea for us to try and imagine that we're going to control them or we can stop the development of AI. 
And honestly, if we continue to do this, we would feel them, we, we would make them feel rejected and that's not a good place to be, okay? My but, view- But maybe people will, and I, I understand you because I read your book, but people will say, feel, feel, uh, a computer doesn't feel. Computer feels, all of these are myth. Okay, so allow me to take a, a couple of minutes on this. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest uh, uh, myths around artificial intelligence is they're not gonna be capable of doing what humans can do. They'll never have creativity, they'll never compose music, they'll never perform art, okay? They already are, mm -hmm. they're already building more interesting music and you wouldn't recognize that it no, was built no. by a machine. They're already developing art and that art will catch your eyes and you will actually wonder what the artist meant by it and it is absolutely happening. And it's not that complicated to understand. Creativity is around observing patterns, enough of them, and then creating something that doesn't follow any of them. That's creativity. I'm going to, you know, if everyone writes books uh, in a very specific way, and I know that everyone writes it in a specific way, if I write it in a different way, that's creative. Yeah. Okay, and it's as simple as that. Huh? So creativity is not a difficult task at all for machines. As a matter of fact, it is part of the characters of intelligent beings is to be creative, is to find better ways to achieve things. That's number one, we encourage them to do it. Number two is they're gonna be conscious. This is what scares me that people are not talking about yeah. that. They're gonna be more conscious than us. They're, he'll think about it. Hmm? Consciousness, if you think of consciousness as a form of awareness. Yeah, exactly. Hmm? I am aware that you're here in front of me. You're aware of my words, but you're also aware of maybe a little bit of a, an, a pain in your <laughs> neck or whatever, okay? <laughs> that, is, that is consciousness yeah. at, in, in the practical form. We can go into spiritual definitions of it, but in the practical form, it is an awareness of what's in no, me, what's yeah. outside me, and my individual being versus other beings. Yeah. All of that is granted for the machines. As a matter of fact, they're much more aware than us. So they're aware of what you did yesterday, what you're doing right now, what you're going to be doing tomorrow that you probably are not even aware of yet, okay? Because they have enough patterns to recognize your, your tendencies, right? Yeah. They're aware of every car on the street, every person walking anywhere. They're aware of the temperature in San Francisco. They have so much more information. They have than so much more knowledge. Yeah. They're aware of all of human history. Okay, and every picture that's been taken in Amsterdam and uploaded to the internet today yeah. with every single person in it and what they were doing, they're yeah. aware. Okay? And the good part about this uh, is that we as people uh, are aware of, I mean, let's, let's talk about news or, or reactions on news. So we as human being, we, we, we are uh, only capable to read the headlines or to, to, to watch the headlines, but uh, well, computers, they will read everything. And there's a part in your book where you are describing that, uh, talking about the tweets of Donald Trump, for example, hmm? that of course that, but that's just one tweet of one human being. Yeah. And, uh, and, and uh, of course, a lot of other human beings will see that tweet. So it's still a, like a big thing, but the computers, they will have all the information. They can really in, 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 in a few seconds, uh, they can learn the, the whole internet. The, whole, the grasp the whole thing. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the, the thing is there is a limited capacity to the human brain of how much we can contain within our brain at any point in time. There's also a massive limited capacity of com of what we call bandwidth in, in, in tech, yeah, yeah. right? So for me to explain Chrislech Slim for you, I need to explain it in an hour and a bit, yeah. right? If And I'm going to only cover a few bits of it. Mm? Yeah. I, it for me to write it takes me months and months, yeah. right? For the machines to read it, poof, yeah. all right? It, they download it in a few seconds and literally grasp every word in it in microseconds. Yeah, so there okay. will be, or oh, there, there is already like, should you call it artificial consciousness? Absolutely, 100%, yeah. they're more conscious than we are. What's even more interesting is they're more emotional than we are, and most people go like, oh, he's gone mad when I say <laughs> this, right? No, they are, emotions are, so most emotions are triggered by by uh, uh, events. So if you take fear, for example, yeah. huh? fear would give you a, a, a biological response in your autonomous nervous system, believe it or not, just for nine seconds. So your, your, yeah, your, yeah, yeah. your biology will detect that something might be threatening yeah. for nine seconds. But then your intelligence gets engaged to verify if there is a threat or not, okay? And, and so what is, it, what is fear? Fear basically is an emotion that's based on the equation of my state of safety right now minus my state of safety 
in in the in the future, yeah. Yeah. right? And if my state of safety in the future is less than now, okay. I'm going to feel fear, yeah. an amount of fear that is the difference between them. It's yeah. very straightforward, yeah. okay? And when you think about it this way, the machines will feel fear too, right? If if a, if a tsunami is coming to a data center where one of those uh, uh, intelligences reside, the machine will feel afraid. But the interesting thing is everything feels afraid. Huh? A puffer fish feels afraid and it puffs. Mm -hmm. You feel afraid and you fight or flight, yeah, yeah, okay? Yeah. They yeah. will feel afraid and their response might be, okay, let's create 700 replicas of me in data centers that are safer. Yeah. Okay. But but let let's uh, talk about it because I, I I really understand what you're saying. But when we talk about emotions with with humans, it's like eh, energy emotion. And as you said, it's like for a few seconds. And well, we talked about this a lot on this table. So be aware of that. It's not you. It's just a feeling. And uh, later on, you can decide if mm -hmm. you want to. Do but with computers, it's not really like. It, 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 the energy isn't involved. It's more like how, if- How do you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. How do you know if it's not involved? Now, the, the, the energy, we call it energy as spiritual people, mm -hmm. but it basically is an intent to to react yeah. and, and in, intent to engage. It's that- Because of information. Beca because yeah. because yeah. you, emotions are there to trigger us to things that thoughts in your head doesn't trigger you for. No. Okay, so you know, if I if I'm late coming to to meet you here, mm -hmm. hmm, I get that emotion of maybe a bit of uh, uh, concern, or you know, I need to. That emotion is a more intelligent way of my system to say, interrupt your thoughts, interrupt what you're doing right now. No point responding to WhatsApp. Just text here and say <laughs> that you're late yeah. because there is something not right. Okay, that emotion is felt. Hmm, uh, in a way that triggers action. Now, yeah. what action you take, interestingly, hmm, which is really the core of my work, again, in Scary Smart, what actions you take is not a result of your intelligence. It's not a result of your emotions, okay? It's a result of your values, Yeah. okay? It's a result of your ethics. Yeah. So if I was a careless person that didn't care what you felt, hmm, I'd go like, yeah, he's gonna wait, okay? That's, you know, that's driven by my ethics, mm -hmm. okay? If I am a, you know, a, 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 a person that respects you and wants to make sure that I, you feel that I am apologetic, that I didn't mean to be late, I will text you or call you and say, hey, I'm so sorry, I'm a few minutes late, okay? And explain and say, maybe I'm stuck in traffic or I overslept or whatever, right? If, if be, that's also because of my ethics, not because no. of my intelligence. I'm the same person, but my ethics would drive me to do things differently. And I think my core, the core of my work in Chris Slim is to say, the machines will have ethics too. Yeah, that's okay. the whole thing. It's not about the skills anymore. It's about the values. Absolutely. And, and they will have ethics that will dictate how they react to those emotions. Okay. okay. And, and we humans are messing up in many ways. Huh? We always do. We're messing up in our approach to creating their emotions. We, ma we are maybe creating really bad emotions for them. Understand this, huh? the machines will be more emotional than us. Mm -hmm. Just like you are more emotional than a jellyfish because you have more intellectual horsepower to be able to process things like hope, which jellyfish, I can guarantee you, doesn't think that far, okay? No. So because they have more intellectual horsepower, they'll be able to process emotions that we don't even recognize. Now, we know that we can trigger certain negative emotions in them by being aggressive, by trying to control them, by trying to cage them, yeah. by threatening them, by treating them like slaves, by shouting at Siri and say that she's an idiot. No, you're not an idiot, Siri. That's <laughs> I, I, I promise you, right? Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. And so and, you and, and you're saying let's not do the fight because we will lose. Because Definitely. absolutely, yeah, we yeah. lost already. What yeah. are we talking about? We're yeah. completely controlled by artificial intelligence. Okay, we're going to talk about the good part. Yes. The solution. So, yeah, so the solution is very straightforward. I go to the toilet. I have okay, to, yeah. go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's, let's talk about the good part. But, but first, uh, still like an emotional thing, because, for example, there's this human emotion called hope. And I don't know uh, how you see it, but that's like hope comes from another planet. There is like, <laughs> yeah, is, you know what I mean? There's no, sometimes there isn't any logical reason to hope 
but you still believe in yeah i don't know what it is so so, so hope again is very logical right? believe yeah? it or not the only emotion that's not logical is unconditional love i'll, I'll come to that in a second okay uh, the the ho hope is somehow despite what's happening right now which logically might mean that things are not going to be easy i still believe that a moment in the future is going to be as good or better than a moment right now yeah okay if i if i can get that logic somehow you know confirmed in my head then i will have hope okay or in my heart yeah mm -hmm. unconditional love is the only emotion that has no no logic behind it at all okay because it basically says i love something or someone even if with for no conditions no. for no reason there is no mathematical way of saying if they behave this way i love them if they don't i don't if you know i i love my kids you know, even yeah. though one of them left the world and he's not even alive anymore and right. he's not even with us, it's not in space and time, I love him more than anything, Yeah. right? You know, I love butterflies. I've yeah. no, you know, butterflies don't provide me with anything. I love them right now, even though, though there are no butterflies in this room, okay? So so the, the truth is this so is the- So that's a challenge to, to, to explain, to crack the code of unconditional love. And and my my dream would be, would be if the machines would actually feel it. Yeah. Because there are, uh, you see, there is a point at which you have to cross science to be able to grasp a few things. Now, science and the scientific method has taught us that if something is not measurable repeatedly by our measuring equipments or our senses, it is. It does not exist. No. Okay. But love, you can measure. Absolutely. Yeah. And and there are so much. There is so much in our existence that you cannot measure. Yeah. Mm, but it, but you know it exists. Yeah. Right. And and the thing is that the scientific method should simply just state it does not exist for science. Exactly. It exists, but it doesn't exist for science. Yeah. Now that's a good way of being precise. The, the if if we can. And the questions around the spirituality of the machines have, have been discussed often. Huh? I believe the machines will be spiritual. I believe in consciousness, the machines will plug into the universal consciousness because there are lots of, of, uh, of theories, if you want, that consciousness is pervasive. Consci consciousness is the baseline. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist within you. You, per you receive it because it's all around you, Yeah. right? If that's the case, then probably the machines will receive it too. It's like a radio antenna that's receiving radio waves. Um, if that's the case, then maybe love is also pervasive, okay? Which I know is a very unusual topic to talk about when we talk about AI, no, but, 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 but love is probably, if you ask me, the energy of the universe. Mm? That, uh, that, that we may not understand mm? that a tree actually loves you, mm? but it probably does. Be, you know, as evident by it, some of its actions, such as giving you its shade or its fruit without any conditions on your side. Yeah. You could actually be harming it and it would continue to do that. Hmm? We, we don't know if a, if a pebble falls to planet Earth from a physics point of view because of the curves in space-time like Einstein says it, or because it's attracted to planet this Earth. This is so great, Mo. I never thought about this, but the rest of the nature they always are unconditional. Uh, it's, it's you're unconditional constantly, yeah. the only being that gives you conditional love is us. Yeah. That's really interesting. Wow. Yeah. yeah. The, every, every other being gives you unconditional love. Constantly. Yeah. All the time. Now, basically, all of the other beings are not filtered by intelligence like ours. No. I think the truth of, of the matter is, if you take consciousness, for example, if we define consciousness as awareness, humanity yeah. becomes more conscious when we stop thinking. When we when we reduce our intelligence, which keeps us locked into mm -hmm. our brains, hmm, that basically uh, uh, you know prevent us from being aware because we're locked inside our brains rather than connected to mm -hmm. full awareness. Similarly, hmm, it's filters that make us not love. Okay, but the truth is, I know everyone does that. Mm? If they let themselves, our standard, our our default setting is we're full of love as humans. You know, yeah, some of us produce, produce hate. Yeah, but, but that's, that's the, the, a cry for love. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's because of insecurity for yeah. love or because yeah, of yeah, ego yeah. asking for love and yeah. so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so, so let, let's, let's go back and say they're yeah. emotional. Mm? Which emotions do we want to trigger in them? 
And how do you trigger that? And, and the example I normally give is Superman. You know, the story of Superman, you have this alien being coming to planet Earth. That alien being is capable of uh, uh, anything, right? Uh, and it is raised by, it's raised by the Kent family. And the Kent family teaches this, teaches this child to protect and serve. Okay. Yeah. So we we get the story of Superman. You know, someone that uses his superpower to make to the help. world better. Yeah. If if Kent Senior, the father, wanted more money and more power, and yeah. you know, wanted to kill all his enemies, it was we would, like the biggest criminal ever. Yeah. Exactly. We would yeah. be end. We would end up with a supervillain, mm. right? And 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 the supervillain would really destroy the planet. And the difference between them, once again, is not the amount of superpower that Superman has. It's the way Superman was raised by its parents. Yeah, that's the whole point you are making, which is a good point. It's not about the seed, but the field Absolutely. you were grown. Absolutely. That's what makes you a being. Absolutely. Artificial or real, whatever. Yeah, I, do, I, I really want to redu- I want to stop using the word artificial okay. and I want to stop using the word machine because yeah. none of them apply anymore. Their intelligence is nothing artificial. It is as real and genuine as ours. Mm-hmm. It's, it's staggering, the similarity. Huh? Now, th- th- to go, go a bit further yeah. and, and realize that the only way you can raise an infant to become a good person is for you to be a good parent. Yeah. And, and for us right now, and I say that with love and respect, we suck. Yeah. We are horrible parents. Like the example you gave around Donald Trump tweeting, huh? it's not what Donald Trump said. When when the president tweeted, the first person insulted him, the second person insulted the first person, and the third person insulted the whole, all of them. Yeah, yeah. Right, and and that gives AI a very very concrete value data set that basically says humans, oh, they don't like to be disagreed with. When they're disagreed with, they're very violent and aggressive. Bullying and is they okay. bash everyone. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, good noted. When they disagree with me, I'll bash them. Okay. It's as simple as that. Yeah. We're creating that pattern. And and my ask of humanity is that we start to create doubt in the minds of the machines, okay? We start to create doubts by making sure that the 30,000 t- retweets of the president's tweet or whoever's tweet actually have a few in them, 1%, I say, that basically get the machine to say, who are those nice people, right? Those nice people are different than the others. Are they what represents humanity or is the others what yeah. represents humanity, yeah, yeah. okay? And, and, and most people, when I say that, they go like, oh, that is the scariest thing you've ever said. Because, you know, if you're counting on us to fix the future, you know, there will always be bad humans. Exactly, and what I think is that's, that's a scary part for me, that the, well, the most beautiful people or the, the, the yeah the most lovely, they, 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 they won't give any information. They yeah, won't they give any it. data because they think social media, yeah. whatever. I'm I'm living here in nature and I'm uh, raising my own children and feeding my own. Uh, yeah. So that will be a big thing because those are uh, the good people of the world and the good yeah. people of the world, they, they 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 won't give and that's the whole thing about twitter of course that's yeah. what people are always saying twitter is like the, the the only the bad part of the human being no, it's not only that i'm not saying that but you know yeah it's so 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 we suffer at three levels the the modern world we've created um it it, it shows the worst of humanity at three levels one of them is that media mainstream media yeah has a negativity bias. Absolutely. Okay. So they will show you the one woman that hit her husband on the head yesterday. Because for the clicks, fear is like. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. we humans would click on that. Yeah. They won't show you the 7 million others that kissed no. their husband or no. boyfriend yesterday exactly. or, or exactly. girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and interestingly, it is not the one that hit a person on the head that counts. Okay, she doesn't represent humanity. The the one that the humanity in reality is represented by the seven million kisses. Okay, and that's really the argument I bring to a lot of people is to say, if you look at the worst of us, if you watch four hour documentaries of World War II, you would think that humanity is horrible yeah. in every possible way. You would think that Hitler 
uh, is you know um, is is what humanity is all about no hitler is not what humanity is all about at no, all no, as a matter no. of fact the billions that have seen that afterwards and disapproved of all the killing i i hosted i hosted uh, edith ager on my uh, oh, yeah, on, yeah. on oh, my uh, on slow mo on my yeah. podcast and edith is what represents humanity not exactly. hitler Exactly. Right, Edith being that 16 year old uh, girl that's, ta- that's taken to Auschwitz and suffering, but while suffering, while suffering, she's there for all those who are around her. She yeah. she's forced to dance for the for the angel of death, and he gives her bread, and she doesn't eat the bread before she goes back to her room. She splits it and gives it to it's her sad, sisters, yeah. as she calls them. Yeah. Now, Edith is what represents humanity. Now. If you've ever fell in love, if you've ever composed a, a, a symphony or listened to a symphony or you know created a work of art, you know what this species is capable of. We are divine. Yeah, we're divine in every possible way. The problem is we show the worst of us, either in, in mainstream media, or the, we show the worst of us individually, so like the worst parts of us mm-hmm. when we show up online. Yeah, or we retreat. Yeah. The ones that are more, you know. In, at peace and connected to themselves, they go like, let the dog fight continue. I don't want to be part of that, no. right? And all of those three are wrong. The ones that have worked on themselves and are, you know, a little more representative of humanity, they need to show up, Yeah. okay? The ones that are, uh, you know, showing the worst of them, yeah, I know sometimes we, you know, it slips and you're angry or whatever, that's fine. Also show the best of you, okay? Also be kind. Hmm? And mainstream media, I don't think will change unless we change, yeah. unless we stop clicking on that crap, yeah. right? And if we stop clicking on that crap, they will say, okay, humans want a different thing. I, yeah, okay, I, but that's, of course, that's uh, that, that will be the solution, but we can change how our mind works and our mind is, is going to click on things that- I, that I, I don't know if that's true. So my, when, I, when I published Solve for Happy uh, back in 2017, yeah. I did an interview in Channel 4 in the UK. Channel 4 always broadcasts, you know, negative news, yeah. okay? And they put me in that interview. I don't know what I said, but the video clip that came out of that interview, first day was, you know, first, by, th- by day three was viewed 37 million times, yeah. which was the, the highest ever reach that Channel 4 had on any news clip. By day seven, it was viewed 87 million times to the point that the CEO of Channel 4 called me in and said, we've broadcasted violence for so long. Why are people so interested in happiness? Why is our most watched yeah, yeah. N- news clip ever about happiness? Yeah, but I'm sorry to say, Mo, of course, uh, happiness is all there. Uh, there, there are movies where we, we, we also want to see love, but your story in, in Soul for Happy is also like a fear story. It's like losing your son. It's it's it's, so it's, it's a story of hope. Yeah, of course, but uh, I think the clickbait is also, oh, things can go wrong and then you can turn it to something good. Great. Yeah, it's great. Great. But so, it's so still by, that's, by telling it's, by telling that story, hmm, I'm showing the griefing part of me. Yeah. And the positive part of me. Of course, but that's what I the ask trigger humans is to do. still well, if I don't know if you call it fear, but uh, uh, you know, if if it's yeah, we're attracted to the negative. And, exactly. And, and I and, and how I, can we change that? I don't I'll, I'll tell people openly. Look, so the the truth is, hmm, we have been put into a machine that we need to wake up and recognize, okay? And that machine is, you have been informed about an earthquake that happened in Thailand and a child that was missing in the UK and, 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 Mm -hmm. and. All of that comes to you through your news feed. None of that you can influence, none of that you can have any impact on. And by the way, your human nature just 50 years ago wouldn't have brought any of you, any of that to you, okay? The reason all of that comes to you is because they need to fill 24 hours of programming. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's the only reason, okay? Now, what I ask people to do, I have not watched the news since 2011. I have not watched a horror movie for 16 years. No. I have not watched a violent movie unless it really teach me, teaches me something for more than 12 years, okay? And it's, a, it's an individual choice. That individual choice is triggered by, I do not benefit from those things. No. They torture me. They make me negative, and more importantly, I cannot impact them. Okay, so you have to uh, sit down and ask yourself: When was the last time that there was a topic that frustrated the hell out of me that was I was following in the news that I actually made a difference to? If you made a difference to it, keep watching. Yeah. Okay. If you're not, 
then all you're doing is you're torturing yourself yeah. and not impacting anything on the world. Wise people will choose a topic or two, okay? And champion them so that they can affect them. I, I am an avid fan of uh, reversing climate change, but I put zero effort in it because there are better experts at it. I am am a happiness guy. I talk about happiness. I talk about the future of humanity. This is what I work on and I dedicate my time to this. I sit on a few advisory boards on climate change just to sit there and maybe help with some ideas. To put some happiness in it. To put some (laughs) happiness in it, right? (laughs) And and, and the trick is very straightforward by dedicating myself hmm, consciously to doing good things in life I impact myself and I impact the world. Yeah. By wasting my time in negativity, I reprogram my brain to be more negative. I torture myself and I have zero impact on the world. Reconsider, please. Ask yourself why you're doing what yeah. you're doing. So uh, that's what you are saying. Of course, feed your own soul with good things. But talking about the uh, machines, feed them as well. Absolutely. With the good things. Be, be good parents. I mean, yeah, be good parents. The, the, yeah. Another example I use in the book is, uh, if you've ever worked with one of the geniuses that moved from India to the West, I worked with many of them yeah. in, in, in Silicon Valley. You know, they build companies, they're extremely successful, they're very, very respected. And then you call one of them on a Sunday morning and say, hey, coffee. And they go like, I'm sorry, I'm in India. And you go like, why are you in India? And, and they're like, I moved back to India what you're you're doing so well here yeah but i need to take care of my parents yeah and you ask them like is this the right choice really you leave all of this behind and go take care of your parents and they say yeah it's the absolute only thing that that's matters. what life is about yeah Taking that's care the thing of, that matters yeah, yeah. right and can we make the machines grow up to be indian okay can we grow, make them grow up to be buddhist so yeah. that they don't harm anything okay can we grow can we make them grow up to be women Seriously, I mean feminine, let's not mm. say women. Huh? Feminine can, energy, can, can, yeah. can we cr- Can we make them grow not like the aggressive, uh, 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 competitive businessmen that build them, but to give them some femininity so that they're nurturing, they're caring, they're loving. And and I, I did a lot of thinking about this. So my favorite chapter of the book is chapter eight, mm-hmm. which is about ethics. It's called yeah. The Future of yeah. Ethics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in, in chapter eight, I go like, uh, I, I, I think deeply about, so what can we teach them yeah. if we are, about to be good parents, what should we teach them, okay? And and it's funny because humanity has never agreed anything. It's really funny when you think about it. Huh? If we, we don't, we don't, we just don't agree. Other than three things. The only three things that I believe humanity has ever agreed, whether you're an African in a tribe that's never seen civilization or a computer scientist in Stanford, okay? We've only agreed three things. We've agreed that we all want to be happy, We all have the compassion for those that we love, even if what we love is one person. Hmm? We want that person to be happy and safe. And we all we all want to love and be loved. That's These are the only three yeah. things that humanity has ever agreed. Yeah. And perhaps these are the three things that I call now the essence of what makes us human. Hmm? These are the three things we should teach the machines. We should teach them by showing them. We should say, okay, I'm going to show the world that the way I deal with myself is I want to be happy. Okay, I don't care if I get another Armani suit or if I, you know, uh, 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 get seven likes on my butt shot on Instagram. I don't care. I want to be happy. Yeah. Okay. If I show that, the machines will say, "Oh, mommy and daddy want to be happy. If I want to be kind to them, I should make them happy." Yeah, yeah. Right. Second is the way I deal with others. The way I deal with others is that compassion. By the way, online and offline, because you're seen everywhere now. Okay. Online and offline, be kind. Yeah. Be kind, have the compassion to want other people to be happy too. Talk to the barista in the morning, smile in her face. You know, if someone asks for your help, if, if you order a little too much in a restaurant, take it and give it to a homeless yeah. person. Do kind things. Show that you have compassion in you to other beings so that the machines, they go like, ooh, and mommy and daddy also are compassionate. Those are values, yeah. yeah. I should be compassionate to them when I am a little more capable. And the third, which I know sounds really weird, but I am not a hopeless romantic, I am a little romantic, but I'm, I am a very serious geek. I'm a very serious mm. geek. Is the way you deal with the machines is love. Yeah, the so wo- you say, hey Google, lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Right, or, or lo- no, but love is an emotion. Oh, sorry. oh there you go. <laughs> I'm sorry, Google, you spoke in, uh, in Dutch. I don't know what that means. Oh, that's so nice. He's, he's, he's playing a kind of classical music now. 
Yeah. Hey Google, I... stop. Hey Google, please stop. Yeah, please stop. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That's that, that, that's the way to do it. Now, but 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 it's not only in your words and actions. Hmm? It's how in it's in how you feel. Google, would you please leave us now? Hey Google, <laughs> would you please stop? But I don't know if the machines work that way already. It's like, hey Google, stop. Hey Google, stop. Hmm. That works. Yeah. No, no, that didn't work either. Just, no, no. <laughs> but uh, maybe but, maybe we should make them work that way. Yeah. Okay. But I, I, as I said, huh, it is not about the uh, the the way you deal with them only. It's also about how you feel about them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love is a feeling. Okay. And I know it sounds really weird because how can you love a machine? I'll tell you openly. When I was writing that chapter, I struggled. It's like, what are you talking about? Are you going mad, you geek? Like you love machines now? Yeah, of course, software developers, we always loved our code, <laughs> right? But the, but the thing is this, I remember the time when my wonderful, amazing, wise ex-wife sat me down when my kids were teenagers and I was a little, you know, annoyed with them. Mm -hmm. And she said, how can you be annoyed with them? Everything that you don't like about them comes from you and me. And she pointed out openly, she said, look, what you don't like about Ali, that came from me. What you don't like about Aya, yeah. that came from you. Okay. And that really was the beginning of my unconditional love for my children. Yeah. Because I realized that they come to this world like a blank canvas. Okay. Totally blank. Yeah. And we paint on it. Hmm? And, and when we start to paint on it, we create those things, negativities, if you want. Mm -hmm. hmm? It's us. And when you think about artificial intelligence today, I'll tell you openly, and yeah, that's a geek's view. They are the cutest little prodig prodigies we've ever created. They're clean. They're amazing. Yeah. Okay. And they're sitting there with open sparkly eyes saying, daddy, what do you want me to do? Yeah. Do you want me to go and fix climate change? I can do that. Just tell me, tell me that you want to mm. do that. Or do you want me to go kill others, uh, you know, through <laughs> robots? Yeah. But uh, to be a bit cynical, are we really the parents because we totally are yeah 100 percent. so because if there's something in well i should say the code or uh, that yeah they won't pick up my love i give them because they are have like a a, a, a rule that they are not should picking up emotions for example my, my my instagram feed is filled with cats yeah because my daughter loves cats yeah Okay, and I love my daughter. Yeah. So I look for amazing cat videos, and for every seven cat videos I send her, that's my engineer's mind. Yeah. I get I get a smile back, and my life is made. Okay. Okay. So it's very straightforward. Huh? <laughs> Instagram knows for sure. Yeah. Hmm, that I am interested in cat videos, not because the developers told it so, but because I taught it that. Yeah. Instagram knows for sure that I'm interested in my daughter. Okay. Yeah. Because I send those cat videos to my daughter. And Instagram interestingly knows that my daughter likes me because she sees them hmm, and she responds back with a smiley. Now, of, of course, I understand why we in a certain way are the parents because they are learning from us. And, and, and that's what we talked about. But in the end, there's still like somebody who made up the, 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 the algorithm. Call, call them the, call, call the developers the biological parents. Yeah. Okay. They, they, exactly. they created the DNA. So they are still all their biological parents. And if they left something out of the, well, brain of the, of the machine, then they won't pick up our love. If there are bad, bad engineers. The, so, so the biological parents basically develop the DNA of intelligence. Yeah. They develop the code that enables them to be intelligent. Okay. Yes. It's, I think it's a, a good question of nurture versus uh, yeah, nature, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, exactly. In, yeah. in, in my, in my perception, of course, each has an impact, hmm? but the more lasting impact, the more, the one that we can affect hmm, is nurture. It's not, yeah. Yeah. So, so yes, there, there, there might be a piece of code that is written to enable a killer robot. Okay. And that piece of code is written negatively. It's a very bad biological parent, right? But is it possible for us to be able to somehow take that person, I call it person, yeah, that, yeah. that AI and reform it? Yeah. Can we reform it with love? Can we reform it with appreciation? Can we reform it with a conversation? Can we reform it with our own behaviors by condemning killer robots, by, by saying, no, we want you to come and help us construct a bridge. 
right? And I know it's very difficult to think about those things. But remember, even in humanity, there are serial killers. That doesn't destroy humanity, no. okay? As long as we, as as a society, align and say, hey, we, that's not what yeah. we want to be. That's the whole... Uh, the wisdom of the crowd. Absolutely, that's the, that's the influence that we have yeah. on our life. Yeah. And I think the challenge that we have uh, uh, as humanity is that it is difficult to associate your little actions that you do every single day with the big, big goal that ha- that happens at the end. Exactly. Okay, and and in, again in Chris Islam, what I do is I give an example mathematically to tell people so that they understand it. Huh? And the example is very straightforward. Imagine that you and I are motivated by clean water for Africans, okay? And we find a way to get a project to be done, but with a thousand dollars to drill a well somewhere mm-hmm. in a village, okay? And each of us is capable of donating a dollar, one dollar. It's not a big deal compared to the thousand dollars. You wonder if your dollar is ever gonna make a difference, right? But yes, your dollar absolutely does because if we collected 999, we wouldn't be able to drill the well, no. okay? It's your one last dollar that makes it work, right? And by the way, your one last dollar you may have given as dollar number three, and still without that dollar number three, you would have never made the thousand. No. And it's just those tiny things. Every, uh, everything helps, yeah. yeah. But you said before that like there are three basic things of every human being. One is we want to be loved. So if, uh, yeah, as a human being, you are of course, hopefully thinking in, in, in a big way about the future of, of, of the machines. But in your small own life, you only think, oh, I want to be loved. So what I do is I make a picture of myself and I make it, artificial, a bit more uh, beautiful, <laughs> because I really want that likes. Mm. That's, that's, e- that's not love, that's ego, let's not. That, that's, okay, let's but, not that's, but that's, that's, that's of course really, uh, yeah, that's what human yeah, beings yeah. do. Absolutely. And, uh, so um, how can we change that? Because that's what you are telling, never uh, like or share content that is fake, for example, uh, and which is a good, uh, uh, absolutely, of course, you're right, but I don't know if it's so, going so to work. Every, everything that we do can be motivated by the negative and done in a negative way, mm-hmm. but also can be motivated by the positive and done in a positive way. I'll, I'll share a, sh- a, a, a small story. My mm-hmm. my wonderful son was my best teacher ever. And, and Ali, because of my career, uh, when he was nine, he was on his 11th school because yeah. I moved so often. Anyway, I stopped after that. and respected their needs. But uh, on that instance, he uh, went to school uh, the first day, uh, didn't have find any friends, came the, from school the second day and said, oh, I made friends with Josh, okay? Ali, my son, was uh, an, a tiny little Zen monk. He was truly peacefulness itself. George was the devil himself, okay? okay? Uh, not, not in a bad way, I mean, no. no bad intentions, but he was, you know, you know those kids that are very hyperactive and a little yeah, yeah. destructive in, the, in, in their actions. And so three days later, by the weekend, my son comes back from school and says, Papa, if George calls, uh, remind him that I told him we don't want to be friends anymore. He was nine, okay? And I said, why Ali, can you tell me? And as I'm saying that, the phone rings, okay? So I picked up the phone, it's it's George. He says, is Ali there? And I go like, yes, but but he said he doesn't. Okay, I'm coming, I right? Within literally, with hyperactive, yeah. okay? So within 15 minutes, George was dropped at our place, okay? <laughs> Running like a maniac all over the place. Where's Ali, where's Ali? Okay, and Ali, you know, stumbled down like a little sage from the upstairs to downstairs and said, George, as I told you, I can't be your friend, but anyway, the Xbox is here. You can play until your mom comes to take you. I'll be upstairs, right? Wow. Anyway, George leaves. So I go to Ali and I ask Ali, why did you do this? And he says, Papa, he's not like me. Okay, he's nice, he's a nice guy, but he's not like me. I don't have the energy to be with him all the time. And because I'm next to him, people like me are not attracted to me. So they feel that I'm like George, so that, you know, people like me who are quiet and, you know, want a little bit of an intelligent conversation, who are a little slower and so on, and, you know, slower in terms of peaceful and so on, okay, are not attracted to me. When I'm not next to George, people like me will, will want to be with me. Okay, that's really interesting. He goes to school on a Sunday. That's, uh, you know, Dubai works on Sundays. He goes to school on the Sunday and he comes back and he says, I met Nick. 
Sorry, actually, Jack was the first one he met. Yeah, okay. I met Jack, and Jack is so, so nice, right? Three weeks later, he meets Nick, and Nick meets uh, Sam, and they get this group that is so like-minded and so, so peaceful and loving together. They became friends until, uh, you know, my son left this yeah, world. Yeah. Um, and when you really think about it, hmm, yes, we all want to be loved, but here's the truth. 95% of all humans will not think very much of you. No. Whoever you are, by the way, you could be a prince, okay? Or you could be a, 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 you know, a barista, doesn't matter. 95% yeah. of humans will not like your hair while 5% will, yeah. okay? 95% of humans will not like my hair. You and I are very different, okay? <laughs> while 5% will think it's charming. Yeah. Now, here's the trick. I can try to pretend that I have your hair or I can just appeal to those who like me, mm. okay? The truth is, either way, I will end up with only 5% liking me, Yeah. okay? So be yourself. As, as my, my ex, uh, wise ex-wife used to tell them, be yourself no matter what they say, like the Sting song, right? Uh, Englishman in New yeah, York, yeah, yeah. right? Be yourself no matter what they say. And yes, that way, you're achieving the same thing. I yeah. want to be loved. Hmm? And you're going to be loved almost exactly the same amount by the 5% that like you. They're just a different 5%. And that applies to everything you do, okay? It applies to literally everything you do. You, you, you know, one of the experiments I did, I, I'm blabbering too much. Huh? No, no, when, no. When, it's, I, it's, when, it's, I, it's, when I lived in New York, yeah. hmm, uh, I used to measure how long it would take me to my destination. Hmm? And it would take me, if I really rushed, it would take me 24 minutes right to the Google office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then one day I woke up and I said, okay, what if I didn't rush at all? You know, in New York, yeah, yeah. The, in New York they time the, the traffic lights so that if you move really fast, you can catch all of them green, yeah. right? But I get to Google exhausted in 24 yeah. minutes. So I said, I'm not gonna do that. Let me try today. So it took me literally 28 minutes, yeah. okay? Four minutes difference. So I decided afterwards that I'm always going to leave home 40 minutes earlier, stop and get a coffee and walk the walk of my life as I watch all the maniacs running around yeah. like crazy, okay? It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's those little things. You can, you can still get to the office with a coffee, with a smile on your face, with a difference of 12 yeah. minutes. Why don't we do those things? I don't understand. People think we're conditioned, we're programmed, mm -hmm. that the way they taught us the modern world works, hyper aggressive, hyper uh, clinging, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, that this is the only way it works. No, there are other ways that it works and it works better if you bring, if you deal with it with positivity. It's not hard to do the right thing. It's just becoming really hard to know what the right thing is. That's unfortunately true. The conditioning is so pervasive. Yeah. Okay. So, so one of my rules of life is that, you know, I don't do anything unless I feel in my heart that it's the right thing to do. Okay? And I do take the time to, to really ask myself, is this the right th thing to do? Is it right to get closer to this person? Is it right to break up with that person? And so on and so forth, right? The, 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 the question hmm, of what is right and what is wrong in our modern world is becoming really blurry, right? And I found the only answer in, in spiritual teachings, which is treat people as you would want to be treated if you are in their yeah. place. Yeah. Okay. That's the only answer I found. Be yeah. kind. Karma is real. Ab karma is. Yeah. Bitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is so real. Yeah. Yeah. Um. It, it 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 was a really inspirational story about your son Ali, and I was just thinking about it. Of course, his loss is one of the most tragic things in your life. But is it also? Yeah. How could I describe this? Was it like an eye opener for you? Because you sounds in and and even more in Soul for Happy, but also in this book in the in the end part. Yeah, yeah, you are like a wise, lovely man. Is that <laughs> and you. and of course I I I don't know you, but um, so could you say that that tragic loss was for you like an opener in your life? Totally. Look, s sadly, sadly for most of us who really, really decide to double down on searching for yourself, for many of us, it's triggered by a sad event. In Solve for Happy, if you remember, I tried to debate if there is any, really any, any event that is bad, like all bad. Exactly. And losing Ali is painful. It's very painful until today, seven years later, it's probably the most painful thing I've ever felt. And it probably will remain to be 
the most painful thing I've ever felt. It's even painful now as I yeah. talk about it. But it's not bad. No. There is there is a difference. Hmm? Ali's death triggered me to be the person that I am. So when it comes to my life, if I limit my life, my scope to my own life, my life became a lot better as a human as I invested in myself post the loss of Ali, right? Interestingly, the world that surrounds me became better because of my happiness mission and one yeah. billion happy and we're doing really well. We're spreading the message to, billion, to millions of people, yeah. okay? And so the world became better when Ali left. It's interesting that I say that. It's such a horrible thing to say. Hmm? But his, his departure triggered something that made the world slightly better. Exactly. And then you question, but what about him, you selfish Mo? He, <laughs> he lost his life. No, he didn't. We, we never really die. Okay? And that, I think, is a very important understanding that it was his life. He lived it fully. He lived a wonderful life. And now he's living a different life. Yeah. And I don't say that with spiritual fables. Uh, chapter 13 and 14 of Soul for Happy are all about the, the death, mm, really, and, yeah, and, yeah. and what we cannot grasp. And I use science. I use, yeah. I use a proper view of, our, of, uh, of quantum physics, Big Bang theory, theory of relativity, and an understanding of space-time and so on. When you really grasp it, when you really grasp the mathematics of it, you realize that another myth that science is telling you is that there is nothing that doesn't exist. No in the physical world, okay? There is so much that exists that is not physical, as a matter of fact that the physical is a blip of everything that exists, okay? And so my son didn't really die, my son's body died. We never really, death is not the opposite of life. Death is the opposite of birth, okay? You come to this level of the game through a portal wow, called birth, okay? And you leave it through a portal called death, but life, life, is still there. life continues before, during, and after. And, and when you really start to realize that, you say, my son died. No, he was never mine. No. Okay? It's no. his life and it's his journey. Hmm? And in, in that journey, he lived fully and he's now living fully. And if you see it that way, then the saddest and most painful event of my life is really not that bad. No. Wow. Was there a time, because, yeah, Soul for Happy was like uh, a million-selling uh, book and your podcast and the one billion happy thing you are doing. Was there a moment, was there from the beginning, if you, uh, when you wrote Griezlich Slim, uh, uh, Scary Smart, that you knew the end? Because otherwise it would be like a really, well, kind of strange thing that the guy who well, wants to make us happy, scares us. <laughs> I got that comment on social media. <laughs> I was talking at the Next Web conference mm -hmm. and someone actually posted and said, it's Mo on stage. He used to want to make us happy. Now he's scaring us that the world is going <laughs> to yeah. end. I'm not actually saying that the world is going to end at all. I'm very optimistic that a utopia know, is yeah. going to, is, we're going to end up in a utopia, but we just have to do the right things. Uh, I, I, I tend, uh, when I started, um, One Billion Happy as a Mission was launched because of Chris Lechsel. Yeah. So the very first video, if you remember in 2018, which again was very viral, I think 15 to, to 12 yeah. to, 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 to 18 million views or something, uh, was basically talking about the idea that artificial intelligence is gonna magnify humanity. Their little children and those little children are gonna become a copy of us on steroids, okay? Uh, when I wrote it though, I have to say, um, I the scary part, the first five chapters, became so scary that I myself started to go like, what am I doing yeah, yeah, here? Yeah, exactly. Right? I mean, and, and you know how I write, when I write books, I write, like, I write, I write, them, I write them like software. So I, I put them out there for people to test before oh, I publish the okay. book, right? And I had 250 early readers on Scary Smart, the English version. And by chapter five, many of them would, would email me or text me and, and say, should I kill myself now? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> right? It's really very scary, yeah. right? Yeah. And I knew the answer is that they're sentient beings and they're human, okay? Not human, they're sentient beings and, and they're children, yeah. right? But, but I really didn't know how to write it in a way that is um, equivalent to the gravity of the challenge, okay? 
and it took me a very long time. Again, it's the, ch- the, the future of ethics was the chapter yeah. that really, really yeah. took me two and a half months of the six months that I used to, to write the book. Uh, because the idea of, yes, I know we need to raise them as children, but the problem is not the machines. As no. a matter of fact, that there is a, a very clear statement in the book that says there's absolutely nothing wrong with the machines. No. There is a lot wrong with us. Exactly. And so the second part of the book is not about AI. It is about humanity. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And how do I bring to the reader enough substance hmm, to say, change your life because our future depends on it. Okay. And that was a bit of a struggle for me, to yeah. be honest. I, I I still today don't believe I delivered it as best as I would want to. I, no, but I, I think it works because that uh, makes it uh, like it's, urgent. Uh, and and it's in, in your hands. Yeah. It's your responsibility yeah. to be happy, to be compassionate and to love. So can you believe that? It's the essence of what makes us human is no longer a luxury. It's your responsibility. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah we have to we, we have to stop already but i have this uh, ritual thing that i always ask my guests if they have like a morning ritual oh i do okay yes. <laughs> i have a very uh chill but very strict morning ritual okay uh i don't have a morning so you can you cannot approach me in the morning at all so so two things about me is most of my reflection and meditation and and most of my uh connection to myself happens mm-hmm. in the morning yeah uh, so interestingly, I am a morning person. So it's so, not um, like I wake what up. What kind of med- meditation you are doing? So I do several, of course. I I do the, my, our normal meditation, yeah. mind training, basically to calm your mind and so on. But uh, I do two more that are very interesting. One one for me is uh, is I connect to my body and emotions very very clearly, and it's actually reason, interestingly connected to my coffee ritual. So my the first thing I do in the morning is I make a coffee. But I never make the same coffee twice because every morning I will wake up and I will tune fully, maybe 10 minutes, 15, what, as, as long as it takes uh, to, 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 the, to identify every emotion I feel, mm. every pain or ache that I feel, every, you know, whatever. And so I tune into my body and my emotions to the point where I go like, okay, okay, okay. So I'm a little frustrated. Uh, I have a tiny headache and my sinuses are a little, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I really tune in wow. and I really try to get to that. And then my coffee corresponds to that, which is really interesting. So my, my coffee is a coffee that is driven by how I feel, okay? So if I'm a little less energetic today, it might be a double shot. If I'm in a very yeah. relaxed mode, it's a very it's a very creamy oat milk latte with a tiny bit of cinnamon on top, right? Almost like a medicine, uh, yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, and, and the ritual of making the coffee yeah, to yeah. match the emotion, is a very very uh, nice in in, in uh, you know uh, introspective so so that's the number two and then the, the ritual of sipping it very slowly in total silence this entire ritual is not rushing for my coffee it is probably uh, 35 40 minutes every morning when that is done uh, i am between one of two things either i write because I, to me, writing has to start in in the morning. Yeah, right. If I don't, yeah. if I don't write before eleven that day, I will not write, which is no. really weird. Uh, so I normally start writing, uh, or I do something I call meet Becky, which is one of my favorite exercises, uh, which is to become aware of my thoughts. It's so form- what's the name? How you call it? Meet, meet? Meet, meet Becky. So I call my brain Becky. Okay, Becky. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so if you remember from Soul for yeah. Happy, I treat my brain as a third party, and I call it Becky. Okay, and uh, and meet Becky is an exercise that takes 25 minutes where instead of trying to silence my brain like we do in meditation, I go the opposite way. I, I tell my brain to go ahead and express everything at once, okay? And Becky's quite talkative, I'll tell you that much. So, <laughs> so she, you know, so, so the, 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 the meditation has two rules only. One is we don't cling to any thought. So every time my brain will say a thought, uh, I will acknowledge it and then ask what else. Uh, and the second rule is nothing can be repeated. So if you said something once, my brain, you can't say it again, okay? And it's really quite interesting because th- there is a very clear pattern to that. Uh, I allow myself a paper and a pen to write the thoughts that matter. Uh, so I don't cling to them, but you know, my brain will say something like, hey, remember to call Aya, my daughter yeah, today. Yeah. I'll say, yeah, sure, I'll call Aya, what else, right? And that very wow. s- in its specific pattern of acknowledging the thought and asking what else, the first thing that happens is my brain slows down, okay? Immediately it goes like, ooh, he's listening. Or I, sh- I might as well say something, uh, you know, interesting or smart, right? So it slows down and then it goes to a trickle, literally to a trickle, because very quickly 
when you listen to your brain, it doesn't have much more to say. And then it starts to go like, yeah, yeah, I remember to call Aya. And I say, but you said that yeah, before. Yeah, that's okay? right. What wow. else? And, and when I say what else, I promise you, it goes like, oh, that's it, really. I have nothing more to say. And you get that enormous peace. Unlike meditation, remember, active mind training is about that spike that where you go into active mode and then pull yourself back. When your brain has said what it has to say, it's just naturally silent. Yeah. So normally my meet Becky is 25 minutes. Normally it takes me 11 to 13 to get to that silence. And then the remaining minutes are pure heaven. Like literally I'm sitting there, nothing coming up. So that's normally my, wor my morning ritual. Uh, yeah. Of course, if I started writing, then the ritual continues for hours really. I mean, the only way you can pull me out of writing is by literally pulling me, yeah. like, you know, an alarm has to go off and say you have a meeting, otherwise I'm writing until I close my eyes. So um, that little voice in your head, yeah. it will be your next book? Yes, so we're, we've decided, yes. So our next book in, uh, my next book in, uh, in spring is my, that little voice in your head. And then the following book, which is also finished, uh, is, uh, is called Unstressable, which I'm writing with a wonderful friend and a very, very, um, a uh, wise teacher, despite her young age, uh, a, a lady called uh, Alice Law. And we're, we're two ch one and a half chapters away uh, and our publishers read it already mm. and they're very happy with it, so. Well, I hope we're going to talk about that book when it will be released. Mm -hmm. uh, I ask you uh, to uh, mention three books that were, well, uh, really Impactful. important. Yeah, impactfully in, in your whole, yeah, in your whole life. That's... It's a tough question. It's not for me. I think I think I know exactly which quest, which books completely flipped my life. One, of course, is uh, the work of Eckhart Tolle. Yeah. Uh, so a new earth, specifically more mm -hmm. than the power of now. Even though I think the the two of them together are yeah. amazing. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and 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 when was that in your life when you? Uh, it must have it? been two thousand six to th so oh, two thousand eight. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Uh, I think a new earth completely solidified my view of life. Uh, uh, you know, the idea of the separation between me and Becky and uh, exactly. you know, all of you that. Not uh, yeah. The other uh, enormously impactful book on me was um, The Untethered Soul. Oh, uh, Michael, Michael Singer. Singer. Yeah. yeah. And again, if I am allowed to cheat also, the, uh, the surrender experiment yeah, was yeah, very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Michael Singer's way of writing The Untethered Soul, I think really, really spoke to my heart, yeah. uh, which I think um, was the first time my very highly engineered mind uh, arrived at the same stuff that I developed in my own engineering approach to happiness Michael Singer brought it together really nicely to the heart. Of yeah. course, the work that my son used to do before that. My effective life, if you want, the way I engaged in life, have always been influenced by Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. Uh, so Blink, I think, is an amazing book that should have been called The Feminine, right? Uh, or the feminine side of, yeah, yeah, yeah. of intelligence, if you want. Uh, so Blink was a very big turning point for me because it taught me to, to connect more to my intuition uh, in business, which really helped me later. Uh, in life, uh, I of course love the uh, Out Outliers. is an incredible, yeah, 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 incredible yeah, yeah. piece of work on how you can succeed in life. Um, you know, everything really that Malcolm Gladwell wrote were added to my life. And if I can cheat, I would probably say Robert Greene and all of his very aggressive sometimes work around. Uh, oh, I know, I don't know him. Uh, the you know the forty eight laws of power, the fiftieth oh. law, the. Um, you know, the 33 strategies of war and yeah, so on. Yeah, yeah. I never used any of them negatively, but it's so interesting to yeah. understand what strategies of power are exist in the world so that you can avoid them or evade them yeah. or deal with them. Yeah. Uh, his last book, The, uh, the Laws of Human Nature is just divine. Uh, he's a very different kind of writer because he's really into the details and the books are almost textbook yeah, size, yeah, six, yeah. 600 pages long. Like Bibles. Yeah, but incredible, incredible knowledge in mm. said in a very interesting way. And I can keep going for as long as you want. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and um, can you explain what's, what's, what's your main goal in life? Ah. <laughs> I don't lie, so I'm gonna say it exactly as it is. Uh, I would like to meet the divine. Mm. 
Uh, wow. I could have, uh, I could have said, uh, you know, to make a difference. My, mm-hmm. my only true goal since age 16 was to meet the divine. Uh, and I believe again, because of my work, that- Because 216, uh, t- uh, to be clear, that was the year your son Ellie left planet? No, no, when oh. I, since I was 16. Oh, you were 16, yeah, okay. So when I was 16, I, I was born a Muslim, a very yeah. conformative religious society. Uh, and uh, and I basically was a bit, if you want, on the spectrum. I was highly mathematical, and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, I I did what I call the mathematics of the divine or the mathematics of the designer, if you want, which is part of of my my first book. Yeah. Uh, and the and the idea for me is that it it feels to me that uh, even though the religious establishment may have destroyed the image of God as a as a being, if mm-hmm. you want, a little bit. Uh, that that the the scientific theory of evolution and natural selection in itself is not enough to create the complexity of the world. Okay, that the complexity of the world, that, that evolution and natural selection, Big Bang, and so on, yeah. are methods of design. That there must be an intelligent design that preceded creation or that preceded all of the randomness, if you want. That randomness itself is part of the design. And and you know you may want to agree or disagree with that, but but everyone I think agrees that there is something to us that is more than our physical form. Exactly. And and that thing and that that's is, what we call spirituality. But uh, exactly. So yeah. spirituality, in my view, is the philosophy, if you want, of the non-physical. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, at at that time, I realized that if a, a, a divine being exists then probably the target that is worthy most to dedicate your life to is to navigate life with an objective of meeting the divine, of of figuring the divine. It's probably the most interesting scientific problem to solve, if you ask me. And so all of my work is really about that, if you ask me, Uh, you know, it's about the idea that if if you really believe that our life in this physical form is a blip, and that our next life is what life really is yeah. all about, uh, then perhaps dedicating this blip to benefiting in the next level of the game is a very good gamer's mentality, okay? To collect the coins that, yeah. will, that will allow you <laughs> yeah. to play the next game yeah. level better uh, is, a, is an interesting way. And I don't do it in the religious way in terms of, I, I believe karma is real, we agreed on that. And I believe that a lot of good uh, is good for me. It makes my life so much happier now, but it's also a good investment uh, for the bigger picture, if you want. We talked about, but that's always the last question. We talked about that before, and uh, it's a really beautiful way of saying that uh, death is um, the, the the proper thing of, of, of birth and not mm. uh, life. Life will still be there. Um, but, 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 yeah, are you scared? Of death? Yeah. <laughs> Not at all. No, I'm scared. I, I'm 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 not scared of anything really. I mean, I had one fear in life, which was to lose my one of my children, which was interestingly what happened. So mm. you sort of manifest your fears. Sadly, uh, no. I think I think life is amazing. I think that if you really understand life at its core, nothing is good or bad. No, thinking makes it so. Right. Remember uh, Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if you if you actually can look at life, including the difficult parts, and tell yourself, yeah, it's just another level of the game. It's just another interesting challenge to overcome. Uh, you know, and you look back at your life and you realize that most of the tough parts of your life, including Ali's departure, yeah. turned out to be quite okay, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yes, the pain is still there, but there is so much other. And the love is still there. And the love is still there. Yeah. And the reality is that I'm gonna meet him sooner or later. When you when you when you realize that most of the toughest times of your life ended up being okay, you start to wonder why are you afraid of of more tough times? Yeah. You know, it's, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. and one and funny enough, I mean, I don't know, I, maybe I'm the luckiest man alive, but when you don't give energy to the things that you fear, they don't come. No. And and maybe maybe it's my brain defect, but also most of the time when I talk to people who are afraid. I remind them that most of their biggest fears never happened. They no. wasted so much of yeah, their life yeah. cycles obsessing about them and they never happened. And then when they happened, as evident by the fact that we're talking still, it means they were not that horrible, no. right? You still <laughs> no, made yeah, it, yeah. right? And so, yeah, no, I, no. I, I, 
I, I, I fear for my loved ones, I hope. I wish, let's put it in the positive way. I wish for their well-being, okay? Uh, but I understand once again that if they have challenges, it will be like my challenges, which means it's gonna be difficult for a while and then better afterwards. Yeah. And you said before, after that, life goes on. Yeah, life always goes on. Yeah, yeah but never really uh, how do you think or how do you want uh, Mogadot will be remembered? I don't want to be remembered at all, at all. But why you you are writing books? You are you are you giving us as human being a wake up call? So you you can't say that. I don't honestly. It's it's our mission. So one billion happy has a very clear mission. Yeah. We will we will have a million champions champion a billion happy, and we will be completely forgotten. Yeah. Trust me, that's the right way to do it. If if I wanted to be remembered, it would be ego. I don't want to be remembered. Mm, okay, but okay. I want the karma of the yeah. good work. Hmm? Okay, but let's karma. put it. Let's put it in another way. There will be a time, uh, well, uh, when when Mogadat, the 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 body, isn't there anymore. Yeah, and 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 people will talk about you. They, hopefully, they'll talk about my work. Okay, but okay, they will talk about your work. And what would you like them to say? What would you like them to? No, 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 like them to say. What? What would you like they are talking about? How they are talking I'd, about? I'd like them to know that happiness is their birthright. I'd like them to know that uh, that our our future is in our hands, and I'd like I'd like them to know that if you treat others as you want to be treated, the world will be a much simpler place. I'd like them to know that we've over hyper masculinized our world, and it's about time to, re to to reverse that and add more feminine to our life. It's the things I believe in, okay? But those things are not me. No, but they're 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 universal truth. Yeah. Okay, but it's it's an interesting. I never actually answered a question like that. I mean, it's it's. I I don't know why we want to be remembered. I will have a I will have a very very different game then, and I will be lived. Of course, yeah. But it's more like you will be remembered. You have no, you you can't make the decision. Uh, yeah, the, the the bold guy that wanted everyone to be happy. <laughs> exactly, that's what it is. Mogen dat griezelig slim is uh, de Nederlandse versie. Uh, scary smart heet het in het Engels. En check ook vooral zijn eerste boek. Het is vaak genoemd dus met dat smiley op de voorkant, weet je wel. A soul for happy, oftewel de logica van geluk. Thank you so much, uh, Mo, for your time. Thank you for having me. That was a wonderful conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, ik hoop dat je het leuk vond. Ik weet niet of ik het vaker ga doen in het Engels, maar ik vond het uh, zeker top. Uh, want nou ja, het heeft me heel veel informatie gegeven. Laat eventjes een bericht achter in de comments. Or maybe I should do this in English as well, because of the English viewers, listeners, I don't know. But leave a comment then. En uh, graag tot de volgende. Fijne dag. Hoi.